I started to involve in human rights maybe first nineties in nineties. Uh, we we establish an international co committee within the uh, framework of Izmir Bar Association, and then we established the first human rights center in nineteen ninety six. Uh, and I became the director of the center. And this is how I started to involve. And then I went to London and uh, I worked for Kurdish Human Rights Project, 1997-1998. And I continued to give them uh, legal consultancy when I came back in 1999 and onwards to handle their cases that, like as if something is happening in Izmir and something different happening in Istanbul, etc. But when I, when I started to look at the picture, uh, okay, you, you are bringing me some, some you know, individual problems, but these problems are not individual, and we need a strategic uh, outlook or strategic uh, you know, approach to deal with all this matter. And then I became a legal consultant of all Protestant community in Turkey, I mean, Turkish Protestants. They have an umbrella organization, which is called um, which is called uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, allies of Turkish Protestant churches, which is not, which is not legally uh, recognized. First of all, as you know, the, there was this uh, deliberately created ambiguity in relation to their legal status. But they, no one, of course, would understand this. They, they all ask me same questions. How can I? Uh, set up a church, how, uh, you know, what are the requirements of uh, obtaining permission for uh, worship, etc., etc. But there were no answers to these questions. And it was so difficult for me at the beginning to explain them. They didn't understand. I said, there is a huge gap here, which, which was created on purpose, by deep state elements, by, by Turkish state traditions, etc. Because Turkey has a tradition of, of excluding non-Muslims. And this is a part of this. Don't take it personally. Uh, Turkey has a uh, very deep rooted uh, policy on this. And it was, I think, this was the most difficult part on, on, on, on, for me uh, to explain them this huge legal gap. Foreigners, Turkish Protestants, they kept all asking the same question. How can I establish a church? What are the legal requirements? I said, there is no legal requirement. It was so difficult. I mean, and I was trying to explain them by using some metaphors, etc. I said, uh, you are living in a Kafkaesque world here, something. So, because it was so difficult, especially to explain the foreigners, Americans, you know, Europeans, etc. They never could understand this. There was, there was even no mention of church in Turkish legal instruments. And then I decided to prepare a report on this. There was no, before this, and I prepared it, I think it, it was 2002 or 2003, there was no report about the situation of non-Muslims whatsoever before this. So it created a kind of shock because I, I uh, after preparing this report, I talked to some ministers and he said, are you the guy? We, we fed up with this report. Everyone putting this, the same, exactly the same report on, on before us. And in this report, I tried to explain this legal gap. And I, I, I believe it created a kind of effect, uh, I believe it, it, it has some influence in, in the amendments, because I also, um, uh, I also attracted the attention of European Union. Christians had all kinds of problems. Their congregations, I mean, even police raided a couple of times during the uh, worship places. They were regarded as, as, as, as completely illegal structure. They were treated like cr criminals. They were taken, for example, uh, in 2000, uh, 2000 something, uh, the, the, the 
Pro the Protestant community uh, of Karataş Church in İzmir were taken into custody. They were taken into the anti-terror department. They were treated like like terrorists. I mean, it was it was the mentality, etc. Missionary activities has always been regarded as a kind of uh, serious crime in Turkey. There is no such crime in, in Turkish legal system. There is no legal provision which punish mission activities in in in in, uh, in Turkish penal penal code, but people were taken into custody for this across the country. And gendarmerie intelligence uh, inter interrogated them. Uh, I think it was the first time the com Protestant community heard the name of Jitem, uh, because some uh, interrogators introduced themselves as as members of Jitem. Uh, they were taken into custody and then uh, they were put a lot of questions, etc. But gendarmerie officials, of course, knew that missionary activity they were doing, they were you know, distributing Bibles in Kemal Pasha district of Izmir. But missionary activity is not a crime under Turkish legal system. So they, they produce a new crime. They forced three villagers to say and uh, to say to the prosecutor that they insulted Islam. And uh, on this statement, they were taken into custody, they were taken to the court and they were put in prison. And they stayed in prison one month uh, until the first hearing in which these villagers came forward uh, before, the, before the court and they said, uh, we were forced to give, a, to give these false statements and they were set free. It started in 2006 in, in, in Trabzon. Uh, Father Santora killed, but no one, including myself, understood that, that, that was, something was unfolding. We couldn't understand. We, we haven't paid attention because it seemed to us that there was this extremely nationalist youngsters who's, who was 16 years uh, old uh, at the time of the incident who shot uh, Santora from behind. But then, when Granting was killed in, in January 19, uh, 2007, it was a serious blow for, for myself. Because Granting was such a symbol for me. I, I was thinking something like this. Okay, then there might be, Turkish democracy might, might be so backward. You know, freedom of expression might be problematic. There might be this fascist deep state, etc. But a person like Hrant Dink could talk in this country, you know, he could travel, he can talk. It's so in this sense, he was a symbol for myself. He was a kind of uh, my, uh, a symbol for my attach attachment to this country. I mean, okay, the, I was say I kept myself before, you know, okay, there might be so much terrible things, but a person like Hrant Dink, uh, he's, a, he's a huge symbol, he's talking. When I heard uh, that he was killed, I felt something broken. I mean, something which tied my, my, myself to this country emotionally, something broken. It was a huge, devastating emotional blow for myself. And then uh, three months later, on uh, 18th April, 2007, I heard First, I heard three Christians killed. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear Nejati's name. It was not clear. They said there was a barbaric act in Malatya, and Christians uh, were traveling there, there. And then I, I started to get some details, and I heard Nejati's names. Nejati was my personal client, and uh, I took his case, this this Kemal Pasha incident, even to the European Court of Human Rights. So it was so difficult to accommodate this feeling. It was so devastating. But then I decided that I should, I should go to Malatya. I should, I should try to help people. Uh, I went to Malatya. Almost all leaders of Protestant community were there. They were so devastated. No one, no one knew what to do. Uh, that night, I, I, I 
said, I forced myself to write something. I, I, I wrote uh, a press release uh, because I thought a message should be given to the public. And then the other day, uh, one of the leaders, Mr. Isan Özbek, uh, read out this, this press release. Uh, and unfortunately, we got we got a, a terrible reaction from our prime minister exactly that night. He said uh, their press release was provocative. I was just uh, trying to emphasize uh, this culture of intolerance, this stigmatization, which leads to this this this this murders. But unfortunately, we got a reaction from, from Prime Minister. And it was, for me, it was an uh, ironic incident because I was also uh, one of the legal assistants of Prime Minister when he was, when he was, uh, when he was going to prison. He contacted me, he contacted me, uh, I think it was in 1999. He was the mayor of Istanbul. You know, he cited this poem in in somewhere, and um, prosecutors press charges, etc. He invited me to consult, and I was ready to give him my legal services. But then he changed his mind, uh, and he didn't go to European Court of Human Rights. Anyway, so uh, then I I got this file. I started to work on it, and. When I look at when I started to look at some details, I grieve suspicious because first it appeared that five youngsters were angry with these Protestants and they decided to punish them. But when I look at the details, I I was not convinced with with this. And then I started to look at this granting case, uh, this Santor etc., and I felt there was a connection between them. Of this, this, the profile of the murderers were exactly the same. They were all youngsters. They were ultra nationalists. They had all these ties with with uh, ultra nationalist organizations. I contacted with with, with the Protestant community. I said, I felt, I think this is a huge case. I cannot handle on my own. I will not get any money from you. But I need the assistance of of lawyers who have different uh, backgrounds, you know, different uh, abilities, etc., etc. All I want you should just to create a pool and collect some money because it will be expensive. Be, be this travel expensive, hotel expense, expenses, and they did. They created a pool. And then I invited almost 25 lawyers from different cities because I, want to, I wanted to create a common eye to see all these commonalities between different different cases, and thanks to people, uh, very talented lawyers came to uh, and came and joined our ranks, and um, we we started to work on the case. And then, as soon as I did this, the shadow behind behind the murder started to to move, started to show itself.